Pueblo del Rio is a public housing project constructed in 1941, located in the Central Alameda neighborhood of South Central Los Angeles, California. Like other housing projects of the era, the Pebble Del Rios, they're originally designed to house low-income laborers at the factories south of downtown Los Angeles and military veterans. But during the 1970s, many of the factories which employed Pebble Del Rios residents were closed down for good. This created a vacuum of opportunity in the area, and as a result, the crime rate is skyrocketed. And by the mid-1970s, the Pebble Del Rios were known for its illegal activities all throughout South Central Los Angeles. Shootings, stabbings, assaults, gang activities, narcotics trafficking, and even vandalism were all frequent at the Pebble de Rio. And most of these activities came from a few gangs in the area. But one of the biggest and most known gang to not only come out of these projects, but also out of Los Angeles, is definitely gonna be the Pebble Bishop Bloods. Today, we're addressing the Pebble Bishops. This gang, they have numerous headlines across the city, which include hits on cops, violent gang wars, and several murders across the city. So this gang, they definitely have a story to tell. Yeah. All right. What kind of Cali's most dangerous? Let's get into it. With names like Weeda Mac, Lemonhead, and Too Tall, you're looking at members of LA's notorious street gang, the Pueblo Bishop Bloods. Most who are now behind bars thanks to a sweeping federal and local operation designed to crack down on violent street gangs. On April 10th of 2005, at around 7.30 p.m., Shantae L., Shanae H., and Shantae's sister-in-law were talking together in front of a house on East 56th Street in Los Angeles, California, with Leandre Hewitt and another man standing nearby smoking. In the midst of them talking, a white car occupied by three men came driving up slowly. And right after that, the front seat passenger, who was sitting on the window frame, fired multiple shots over the car's roof towards the group on the street. As a result of the shooting, Shante, Shanae, and Hewitt were all hit. And unfortunately, Hewitt, who had been shot in the chest, died from his wounds. Maria M., who lived some blocks away from the shooting, heard gunshots, and shortly thereafter, saw a car stop nearby. The two passengers got out of the car and started running. And while running away from the scene, Maria saw a part of a gun in the rear passenger's waistband. The men weren't immediately caught, but on April 13th, police officers responded to a report of a gunfire arrested RC. RC led police to another location where Dion M was talking to Antonio W. When Dion saw the police, he yelled to Antonio, who ran towards the garage and threw a gun under a car. Police then recovered the gun, which is a 38 caliber revolver. RC was a member of the Oriental Boys, which is a gang that also resides in the Pueblo de Rio housing projects and have close ties to the Pueblos. In fact, Leo and Antonio were members of the Pueblo Bishop Bloods. During this interview, RC told police he knew something about the shooting on 56th Street. He mentioned he heard Jackson and Mitchell talking about having been in a fight with someone named K.O. So Jackson said, let's go take it out on some villains. After that, they each armed themselves with revolvers and left as it was getting dark. The next day, R.C. overheard Mitchell and Jackson talking about the shooting that they had carried out. He quoted Jackson saying, they had seen a nigga and a couple people standing right there and a the nigga was taking a piss. So he hopped out and got on foot. He also said, so they walked up to the other guy after the guy finished taking a piss and Jackson started busting at him. And Mitchell, he started busting at the crowd of people. And right after that conversation, the members warned those listening to be watchful for revenge attack by the Bloodstone villains. Officer Gerald Harden testified as a gang expert. He knew both men as members of the Pueblo Bishop Bloods, a gang of some 200 members. The Pueblo Del Rio housing project, from which the gang took its name, was within the territory claimed by the Pueblo Bishop Bloods. They are primarily the African-American gang, although they were aligned with the Oriental Boys, who are primarily Cambodian. The two gangs committed crimes together. The Pedal Bishop Blood's principal activities included drug sales, robberies, drive-bys, extortion, and witness intimidation. The Pedal Bishop Bloods were bitter rivals of the Bloodstone villains. The two gangs used to get along 
But ever since the dispute over drugs and money accumulated into a shooting, it's been basically an all-out war. The Bloodstone villains claim 56th Street as part of their territory. In fact, that's where they're originally from. So, if you remember the Pebble Bishop Bloods, he went to find some villains, where do you go? 56th Street, said the officer. The family Swans were a gang associated with the Bloodstone villain, and Hewitt, the murder victim, had been a family Swans member. This is because due to close ties, the family Swans congregated in the Bloodstone villain's territory, particularly on 56th Street. Harden testified that the shooting would have been committed for the benefit of the Pebble Bishop Bloods, most obviously because of the rivalry between them and the Bloodstone villains. He's quoted saying, it's a constant back and forth, shooting incidents between the two gangs. They do this to one up the gang. If they're down, they go back, and it can be retaliation from something that could have happened months ago. Going out there and shooting somebody from the villains, you're gonna get shot straight to the top, be revered. And it also shows the villains that the Pedlos have no problem driving over here and pulling the trigger. They have no problem just going down the street and just shooting at a random crowd, but leaving as villains. Officer Harden also testified that if a gun is used in a crime, say like in a shooting or a murder, a lot of the time it's not kept by that person. It's handed off to somebody else who then hands it off to somebody else. KO, the person whose fight with Jackson and Mitchell, a tricker he was killing. He was a member of the Pebble Bishop Blood. Well, Archie told police that KO had family members who were bloodstone villains. In the end, through the statements from several witnesses, gang members, and gang experts, and ballistics evidence, James Jackson and Michael Antonio Mitchell were convicted of first degree murder and two counts of attempted premeditated murder and sentenced to state prison for 75 years to life. Yeah, rest in peace to Leandro Hewitt. He got caught in the middle of a daily war with the Pebble Bishop Bloods and the Bloodstone Villains. The insane part is that this story is only one of many between the two games. And as you're about to find out, they get way more crazier than this. Before we address all that, let's get into who these guys are. Who are the Pablo Bishop Bloods? But I know your type, but I know your kind. You're not going to do nothing for our black community but bring it down. That's all you're going to do. And you, you, you send policemen around here on a daily basis to patrol the neighborhood, and they've been innocently taking people to jail for no reason, beating up people, shooting at people, killing people. And then you're going to come over here with a publicity stunt and try to uplift so you, can, so you can be president. You know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you feel that way. I, 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 I feel like this every day about all your people and about all your kind. The Eastside Pebble Bishop Bloods are a predominantly African-American street gang based in the Pebble Del Rio housing projects in South Los Angeles and a community known as the Low Bottoms. When it comes to other races, they are definitely known to have them from the gang. Of course, it's African-Americans, but it's also Mexicans and Asians from the gang as well. The Pebbles as a blood gang, they've been active in the area since the early 1970s, and also before the blood identity was even forged, dating back to the 1950s. Prior to the black gang resurgence in the early 1970s, there were gangs in the area called the Pebble Players, and they were active since the 1950s. When it comes to the gang's name, it comes from the Pebble Real Housing Project, which is near 55th Street and Alameda Street. In their territory, it's surrounded with nothing but enemy gangs, including the Bloodstone villains who are right across the street, the 4A Gangsta Crips, and 38th Street, which are one of their top rivals today. Yeah, these guys are known for pulling up to each other's hood, and often, they're up to no good. Oh, Pepto, we all bitch ass niggas at. Thir Whoa! Niggas, not all sorry, cuz T Game, we all bitch ass niggas at. Where's niggas at though? Niggas see the street, bitch. Oh, pep blows. Niggas, niggas, niggas wanna make. It's been more than a few daily situations that played out between these two games. A crazy one played out in 2007. On March 18th of 2007, Laura Sanchez and her son Jose had just returned home from a day running errands. They had grabbed some clothes from the mall, went grocery shopping, and lastly went to go see some family members. Overall, the day was seductive, long, and tiring. So Sanchez and Jose, they were only focused on getting into their house and relaxing. Sadly though, this wasn't how that played out. 
As Sanchez put her blue Astro van in front of her home on Long Beach Avenue, Jose, who was sitting in the front passenger seat, noticed a white car slowly driving up on the driver's side of the car. Jose immediately gets out of the van. And right after that, he heard his mom yell, Duck! Duck down! As he heard two sets of gunshots and saw several sparks flying off the car. Jose then drops to the ground and began to crawl towards the driveway. Meanwhile, Sanchez's nieces, Sandy and Jeanette C, were sitting inside their mother's SUV, which was parked in Sanchez's driveway. Both girls heard a set of very loud gunshots coming from a white passenger car and a second set that was not as loud coming from a gray truck. Sandy saw gunshots coming from a white four-door car that had stopped behind her aunt's van. She and Jenna also saw gunshots coming from a gray SUV that had pulled up next to their car and seen a car speed away after the shooting. In addition, there were several calls to the cops with a few reporting that a gray Chevrolet Trailblazer with two male Hispanics in it were involved in the shooting. Jose, he escaped the shooting on arm. But unfortunately, Sanchez, she died from a gunshot wound to her lung and her heart, which caused massive hemorrhaging and death within two minutes. The bullet entered the left side of Sanchez's back and exited her right upper chest. Forensic testing, it showed that it would have been unusual for a small caliber bullet, such as a 25 caliber bullet, to pass through a human body, but not a larger caliber bullet. Los Angeles Police Detective Daniel Gershner arrived on the scene shortly before 1 a.m. He recovered two 25 caliber bullets from the Astro van and two larger bullets on Long Beach Avenue from the driver's seat. There was also another bullet found underneath the van. The 25 caliber bullets were found to have been fired from a gun later recovered, and the two larger caliber bullets were found most likely to be 44 caliber bullets from a revolver. Investigators used trajectory rods to determine the path the bullets took when they entered Sanchez's Astro van. It was determined that the larger caliber bullets were fired from the rear of the Astro van towards the front, while the 25 caliber bullets were fired from the front of the van towards the back. At that time, though, that was pretty much all the information the cops had on how the shooting played out. But after the arrest and interrogation of J.K. Gray, an admitted Pablo Bishop blood member, and several other members, the cops had all the information they needed on who carried out the shootings. J.K. Gray, said on the day Sanchez was shot, he and his homeboys, Jamal Payne, also known as PJ, Damian Garrett, also known as D-Dog, Roger Jenkins, and Jerry Sherrills, also known as K.O., among others, were outside the Pebble Real Housing Projects located on 55th Street and Long Beach Avenue in Los Angeles, California. The group discussed going and doing something down in the Athens, though Gray denied there was any talk of shooting anyone. Gray was aware that another Pebble Bishop gang member named Poncho had been shot by Athens gang members. He said the group left in three cars, a gray Chevrolet Trailblazer, a black Cadillac Escalade, and a white Chevrolet Impala. Payne drove the Trailblazer, Red drove the Escalade, and Anthony Lowe, also known as Baby Damu, drove the Impala. Grace sat in the back of the Trailblazer with Arthur Maiden, and Jenkins, who brought a firearm with him, sat in the front passenger seat. Soros rode with Garrett in the Escalade, and Marquez Edwards, also known as Uzi, rode with Lowe in the Impala. Gray testified that the caravan drove south on Avalon Boulevard, but didn't see any Athens Park blood members. They turned back towards the Pebble Real Housing Projects when Garrett stopped the Escalade at Long Beach Avenue on 48th Place. Gray saw Cerros reach out of the Escalade's front passenger window and fire a gun. Payne then stopped his trailblazer behind the Escalade and Jenkins fired a handgun into the car. After that, they then sped away. Gray was granted immunity for his testimony, which he believed meant that no charges would be filed against him, even if he was a shooter. At trial, however, Gray refused to answer any questions and invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege. As a result, the trial court found Gray was unable to testify and admitted his preliminary hearing testimony into evidence. Detective Garston reviewed photos of Pebble Bishop blood members together, including Gray, Payne, Marquise Edwards, Grant, Poncho, Shepard, Arthur Maiden, Cyrils, and Jenkins. When Detective Carson spoke with Ponto Shepard on March 18th of 2017, he noticed that one of his hands was injured. The detective also viewed footage from a video surveillance camera located in a tow yard at the corner of Long Beach Avenue on Vernon called Laura's Toe. The video showed a caravan consisting of a black Escalade, a white Chevrolet Impala, 
in a gray trailblazer driving on Vernon Avenue from Long Beach Avenue. During this investigation, Garza spotted a white Chevy Impala at the Pueblo Rio housing project. Anthony Lowe, also known as Baby Damu, an admitted Pueblo Bishop gang member, was driving the Impala at the time and fled when Detective Garza and his partner made the stop. The Impala, it was later discovered to be registered to Lowe's mother. Detective Garza, who also personally searched the black Cadillac Escalade belonging to Garrett's grandmother and a gray Chevy Trailblazer belonging to Jamal Payne, opined that the Escalade and Lois tow yard was the same as the one driven by Garrett. The white Impala in this video was the one driven by Lowe, and the Trailblazer was the one belonging to Payne. Sanchez's son identified the white Impala as the same one he saw during the shoot. Dario Salazar Marino was interviewed by Detective Garsner on April 5th of 2007. Moreno identified Payne, Gray, Jenkins, and Maiden from photographs. He also identified a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun that another Pueblo Bishop gang member, Deion Harper, had in his possession at the time of his arrest. Moreno told Detective Garsner that he saw Harper holding the same gun approximately a month before Sanchez's murder. In the early morning after Sanchez's murder, Payne, Gray, Jenkins, and Maine arrived at Marino's home. Gray told Marino, we just shot someone, and we need you to take the guns, because the heat is coming. He also told the detectives that Jenkins threatened to hit him if he didn't take the guns. The next day, Marino heard them talking about killing a woman while they were trying to shoot a 38th Street gang member. Marino identified Gray and Payne as the shooters and made him to Jenkins as the passengers, but refused to explain how he came by this information. At trial, Marino denied a detective interviewed him and denied ever hearing of Sanchez's murder. He also testified that he lived at the Pebble Rio housing projects and that he knew snitches that testified against gang members were killed. Detective Garzner also interviewed Shuros on April 22nd of 2007. Shuros told Garzner that his moniker was KO. His cousin who had been killed had also been known as KO. He denied any involvement in the shooting telling Detective Garzner that he went to church that evening and then went straight home. When shows continued to deny any involvement in Sanchez's shooting, Detective Garzner and his partner left the interview room. After Detective Garzner left, Detective Richard Garzner had a conversation with Shuros. He said he believed that the 38th Street gang was responsible for killing his cousin K.O. When Garzner returned, Shuros admitted that he was driving a black SUV to a strip club in Torrance when someone approached his car on 48th Street in Long Beach Avenue. He fired his revolver several times in the air to scare him off. On April 27, 2007, Garrett and Cheryl were placed in a monitor cell together and their recorded statements were admitted into evidence at trial. Cheryl told Garrett that he suspected Garrett was snitching because police showed him every picture except for that nigga blood. Cheryl then told Garrett that he had raised Garrett's number as well as baby Don moves. He later stated they got everybody who was riding with him. While alone in a cell with the monitor telephone, Garrett said that he had been booked for 187. He later noted they still can't prove nothing. Maybe we was just passing by. He also said, I could be put away for everything that matters, man. You know, I really fucked up, man. He then stated, this is a learning lesson. Do right. That's all it is. The detectives pretty much had all they needed to convict a man, but on May 2nd of 2007, Detective Garson interviewed Jenkins. Jenkins told Garzner that he was going towards Vernon when he heard gunshots in the passenger seat of the car. Jenkins was arrested and placed in a monitor cell with Avery Kemp on May 4th of 2007. In the recording, Jenkins and Kemp discussed what the police had told them about Sanchez's murder. Jenkins told Kemp that he didn't believe the police had any photographs of him because his windows were tinted and he thought the only camera on Long Beach Avenue was facing oncoming traffic. He suspected that somebody is really snitching and described the altercation between Athens Park gang members and the Pelo Bishop Blood gang members that resulted from somebody snitching. He stated that he did not care about a Pebble Bishop gang member being shot in the hand because he was a snitch. He also told Kemp that one of his homies had been arrested on possession of a strap or a gun. He was concerned that the other gang member would snitch on him. He said, that was a strap that murdered the bitch, but now all of a sudden, they trying to say that the other strap murdered the bitch. You feel me? They ran for rinses and shit like that, and the other strap murdered the bitch. You feel me? They say it like they already know. 
In the end, Payne, Searles, Garrett, and Jenkins were charged with murder. Searles was sentenced to 25 years to life, plus 25 years for the firearm enhancement. With Garrett, Payne, and Jenkins being sentenced to 25 years to life, plus 25 years to life for the firearm enhancement. Rest in peace to Laura Sanchez. With her last words telling her son to duck down, she was a mother who died trying to protect her son. This played out in 2007, but 38th Street and the Pueblos have been going at it since the 1990s. This is because, like I already mentioned, the distance between most gangs in this area are damn near right across the street from each other. So as a gang member, it's down near a big ass maze you have to maneuver through in order to survive. This area is well known in the streets. It's often referred as the low bottom. And most of the gangs in this area are known for being some of the most dangerous in Los Angeles. And when it comes to the Pueblos, they stand as one of the most feared and respected in your area. And trust, these guys are deep when it comes to numbers. Yeah, go into Pueblo Real Housing Projects. I promise you'll see them on every corner and every house or curb you pass by, if they even give you a pass. That's because the Pueblo Bishop Bloods have grown from a street gang to more organized criminal empire with over 300 active members and have a history of controlling the Pueblo Del Rio housing projects through intimidation and acts of violence against residents and members of rival gangs. And the gang's cliques are known to be ruthless. The Five Dudes Pueblo Bishop Bloods, also known as the East Side Low Bottoms, which is their largest clique, is located on 52nd Street inside the Pueblo housing project. And trust, these cliques are known for a lot. Matter of fact, in 2010, FBI agents and LAPD officers arrested 41 members of the Pueblo Bishop Bloods after a two-year investigation and raid dubbed Operation Family Ties. It's called Operation Family Ties because many of the targets are related, live near each other in a South LA housing complex. It's become a haven for gang activity, they say. So much so, reports Chris Blatchford, that the feds are pursuing an organized crime RICO indictment. Hundreds of cops, guns at the ready, come looking for a long list of alleged crooks. By the end of the day, nearly four dozen are walked off in cuffs and taken to jail. Feds say all are members or associates of a South Los Angeles gang called the Pueblo Bishop Bloods. This is their home turf, the Pueblo Del Rio Housing Project. And in this 88-page federal racketeering indictment, Agents say the gang is involved in drug traffic, gun trafficking, armed robbery, extortion, assaults, intimidating witnesses, and murders. U.S. Attorney Andre Barat. One of the murder victims was killed with a shotgun while his two-year-old son watched his father die. Agents say that cocaine, crack, heroin, and marijuana are pushed here on a daily basis, and that older gangsters with nicknames such as Dr. Dirt, Weedamack, Too Tall, and Lee Dog enlist younger gang members to do the dirty work. Leaders of the gang want to, quote, make sure a gun is on every corner, every cr end quote, to protect their lucrative drug trade. Investigators say much of the illegal business is conducted on playgrounds in the complex and in the shadow of a nearby elementary school. Feds insist these busts will make a significant dent in the Pueblo Bishop's operation and drastically change the complexion of the neighborhood. Members of the Pueblos were indicted on federal racketeering charges. They were also accused of using mob tactics, such as violence, murders, robbery, extortion, gang-related shootings, and witness intimidation. In addition, they're accused of harassing law enforcement officers who patrol their stomach grounds. And this is the main reason they're the first gang in Los Angeles to be hit with the gang sweep that involved the Organized Crime RICO Act. This RICO Act, it also made the news for a lot of other gruesome shit. Like Aronda Young, also known as Pebble Grump, and Anthony Grubble, also known as Bandit, who were two known members of the Pebble Bishops, shot an innocent man named Francisco Canelo in the back with a shotgun. The victim, he was vacuuming in his car when he was killed in front of his two-year-old son. Francisco, he was mistaken for a 38th Street gang member. According to evidence presented at trial, on the day of Canelo's murder, Young, accompanied by other armed gang members, drove his car into rival gang territory, seeking retaliation for a federal drive-by shooting of a Pedro Bishop gang member. Canelo, he was targeted simply because of his Hispanic descent and was in a rival gang territory. Local authorities originally charged Young in 2013 with the killing of Canelo, 
but he was acquitted by state jury. After a retrial, Young and 41 other gang members were convicted of federal RICO and related charges, and they've been held responsible for the multiple murders. The crazy part is that they only scratched the surface of the known interactions between the cops and the Peblos. It happens that fast. You're watching video of an intense LAPD shooting that left both an officer and an armed suspect down. It happened on April 20th when Newton area gang unit officers pulled over a vehicle that failed to stop. The driver eventually bails out on foot and officers give chase. As officers are chasing the suspect down, you're going to notice this man. His name is Curly Duff and he runs behind the buildings. As he's running, you can see him starting to reach into his waistband. Just a short time later, he chases after one passing LAPD officer before he turns towards a second, pulls out a gun, and fires. The LAPD officer shoots back, hitting Duff multiple times. While the officer comes out on the better end of that shootout, he was hit by gunfire. I'm here, bro, my leg. More officers arrive on scene and come to the officer's aid. Hey, turn again, turn again, bro. Turn again, turn again, right now. Thankfully, he survived, and officers were able to recover the gun Duff used in the attack. The cops and the Peblos have a lot of animosity towards each other. And trust, cops aren't victims either. It's alleged that during a sting in the Peblos, a cop had a Peblo member cuffed, and during a brief confrontation, the cop shot a handcuffed member in the head. The situation has gotten so tense, officers don't even enter their territory to Peblo real housing projects without backup. Damn, trappers, Cop attackers and a whole lot of gun clappers. These Peblo niggas definitely ain't no actors. Bars, nigga. To fully understand why this game moves in such a brutal nature, we have to go over the history of these guys. History of the Peblo Bishop Bloods. Homies in this shit. Don't never shit come and return. Homies in the hood balling now trying to put a nigga on another. So we still out here taking chances, bro. I mean, it's easy for you to say you've been going through this shit for a minute. You already been doing this shit. We still trying to find a way in. Shit, so man, I mean, right. if you All got right. a better way, then shit, we with it. All so, right. so the you better know. way is you. You the better way. You the better way. Period. If a motherfucker ain't on you already, <laughs> like you on yourself, and they don't listen to what you speaking, nigga, it speaks for itself. Yeah. A motherfucker either understand it or he don't. That's it. You know what I mean? Real life. During the 1950s, in the Pedro del Rio housing projects in the surrounding area, a small gang was starting up and making a name for themselves. During this era, you had games like the Slossons, the Businessmen, and of course, the Peblo Players. The Peblos, they were established well before the formation of a lot of black gangs and even before the Bloods and the Crips. Even though the Peblos are the first bishops to be established, originally, they didn't move as a gang. It was just a club of kids protecting their area and looking out for each other. But during the 1970s, after a few meetings and negotiations, the new gang identity was forged, creating the 52nd Street Pueblo Bishop Blood, establishing their close ties with the Nine Deuce Bishops, led by Bobby Lavender. During this time, the East Side Cribs, today known as the East Coast Cribs, were establishing themselves in various areas on the East Side, and clashes between the Cribs and the Pueblo Bishops occurred damn near daily. The confrontations got so intense that the Bishops made a point to separate themselves from the Cribs. And by 1978, after a few meetings with Triple OGs, OG Stutterbox, Poochie, Mr. Magic, Sharky, Sure Nose, and Space Ghost, the Peblos they added the blood to their name and actively fought against all Crips in the area of the project. And the Peblos, from day one, they were known for running Crips out of their projects, with more than a few stories coming out of their area. And once established, this game quickly grew. They became known as the Five Deuce Pebble Bishop Bloods, and they created another identity known as the Mid-City Gangster. Also in recent years, members created another identity, 54th Street Pebble Bishop Blood. They've been on the east side, particularly the low bottoms, one of the most dangerous areas in Los Angeles, survival was key. And to survive, you had to be militant. That's why these cliques are known to terrorize their eye. They're known to go to a war with multiple gangs. So a list of rivals is definitely gonna be long for the Pebble Bishop Blood. Allies and rivals. When it comes to allies, 
The Pebbles don't have a lot of them. They also had an alliance with an Asian blood gang in the same projects known as the Oriental Boys. And these two gangs were known to move heavily with each other throughout the years. They also have a truce with the Avalon Gangster Crips and the Broadway Gangster Crips. Originally, this alliance caused a lot of animosity amongst a large group of Bloods in the South Los Angeles region. But these days, you see a lot of Bloods and Crips and Truces due to a lot of common enemy. But let's just note that these guys have the longest standing peace treaty amongst gangs in Los Angeles. Just brothers running up and putting up bullshit behind them, which is definitely something that needs to be highlighted in this video. The Pebbles also get along and have some alliances with some Serenios too. For example, they're real tight with the Ferencia 13. In fact, Ferencia 13 affiliates and Pebble Bishop members have numerous music videos together. But that's pretty much it when it comes to who they get along with. But when it comes to their rivals, like we already mentioned, that list is long. They beef with the 4A Gangsta Crips, the Eastside 4 Deuce Gangsta Crips, and the Eastside 4 Trey Gangsta Crips, and the Six Pack East Coast Crips. And also, like I already mentioned, they have a fierce rivalry going on with 38th Street. Y'all heard one story about these gangs war, but trust, it's a lot more stories about how these guys are known to go at it with each other. But the biggest rivalry, which is rightly regarded as one of the longest blood on blood feuds in the history of Los Angeles gangs, with this conflict causing several federal gang related shootings and innocent bystander casualties, it's definitely going to be with the Bloodstone villain. Beef with the Bloodstone villains. Davion McClellan, an unidentified male, are riding bicycles up and down Hoover Avenue near 55th Street in Los Angeles, California one evening. This area, it was claimed by the Bloodstone villain. He was a rival of the rival Pebble Bishop Bloods. McKinley and his homie encountered Michael Smith and Bloodstone villain member Kenneth Corbin walking along Hooper Avenue. Either McKeelan or his companion called out, So woo! Indicating that he was a member of a gang affiliated with the Bloods. Smith and Corbin then turned around and gave him a head nod, kept it pushing. But seeming to come out of nowhere, McKinley started shooting at him, firing about six shots in total. After the shooting, Corbin and Smith, they ran away from the scene. Neither of the two had been hit by a bullet, but one bullet entered a nearby backyard, striking and killing both 22-month-year-old Joshua Montez and his great uncle, who was carrying him. McLean also fled the scene, but he was caught shortly after. And in the end, he was convicted of the two murder counts and sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. Once again, if you watch the Bloodstone Villains video, there's plenty of cases I found about the Bloodstone Villains and the Pebbles going to war, since you guys already heard a few. But the one I gave just now, I only told that one to give an insight on how these deadly wars can victimize people who have absolutely nothing to do with the situation in the first place. Once again, rest in peace to Joshua Montez. At just 22 months old, he didn't even get a chance to make it to his second birthday. That shit's just sad. This incident, it occurred 10 years ago. But these two gangs have been going to war way longer than that. The war with the Bloodstone villains and the Pebble Bishop Bloods is a combination of complicated, sadness, and a lot of confusion. The reason for this is because the two gangs used to be close. Down their family, with the two gangs being allied with each other. In fact, they once referred to this relationship as the Villa Peblos, or the Peblo Villains. They were so tight that these guys down there did everything together. The villains attend their parties, their get-togethers, and the other types of functions in the Peblo Real projects, and vice versa. It was always mutual love on both sides. Yeah, it was common to see graffiti on sidewalks, walls, curves, and other city properties, which represented their alliance, tagged as BPSV, Peblo Bloodstone Villains, or PSVPV, Bloodstone Villains, Pebble Bishops. But all this, it quickly went south after a botched drug deal in 1998. On that night, a member of the Pebble Bishop Bloods murdered a known Bloodstone villain known as Do Dirty, execution style, during a drug deal. However, an LAPD officer and a gang expert said the Pebble Bishop Bloods and the Bloodstone villains have been feuding since the 1980s. On top of that, it's alleged that Bloodstone member Do Dirty was robbing drug dealers, so the Pebbles took him out and started the war. 
So the exact cause of the feud is disputed to this day. So any OGs or anybody tapped in, if you guys know the exact cause, let me know in the comments. Let's have a conversation about it. Also, if you guys think that there's any chance at all that you guys can come to the truth or at least neutral standing with each other, y'all let me know in the comments about that as well. Let's have a conversation about that. Even though the exact cause isn't known, the hatred they have for each other can be seen on both sides. Danger rating for the Pedro Bishop Bloods. The Pedro Bishop Bloods are going to receive a danger rating of a 9.4 out of 10 based off of the gang's long history of violence, daily work, the enemies, and so much more other shit. Yeah, try Pedro. Don't be surprised if you start shooting though. Keep your head low. Otherwise, you can end up dead, bro. Bars, nigga. <laughs> nah, look. Y'all heard a few stories at this point. These guys are not to be played with. But the low bottoms are known for their brutal activity. So the Peblos, they have to move militant in order to survive this long. What do y'all think though? But y'all went lower or higher? Y'all let me know in the comments. Y'all got any crazy stories about these guys? Any close calls? Y'all also let me know in the comments. Let's have a conversation about it. Prominent figures from the set. Over the years, the Pebble Bishop Bloods have had more than a few names who have made the game so respected and feared today but they also have a long list of casualties due to the violence and gang wars this faction has engaged in. A few of them include Benjamin Clemens, also known as Ben Capone, who died on March 3rd of 2008 after being shot and killed. It's also Cyclone, Damu, Dev Dog, Baby Dirt, Fat Man, Fish, Kangle, Magic, Nut, Lil Nut, Nuki, Peanut, Poochie, Skibo, Skinzo, Pablo Steve, Baby Stutterbox, Pasta, Larry McDuff, also known as Tippy, Tone Tone, Willie Bobo, Willie Reed, Wolfie Loke, Yaya, Jesse McWayne, and Ben Capone. Rest in peace to all in. Y'all let me know in the comments if any other members were longer with us. Let their names live on. In addition, it's a long list of members who put in a lot of groundwork to make the game what it is today. A few of them include Stutterbox, Poochie, Mr. Magic, Sharky, Sure Nose, Space Ghost, Bolo, Project Bo, Dangerous Dan, J Killer, Dr. Dirt, JC, Too Tall, L, Lee Dog, Lemon, Lemonhead, Sweets, Chista, L Killer, Lil Rob, Baby Ben, and Too Hard. They also have some rappers who have been making noise for the game. There's a documentary called Rep Yo Set, which features several gangs. The Pebbles were featured in the documentary, telling their personal tales, and even made a few songs with one being called Don't Get Caught Up. If you haven't heard it yet, y'all definitely go tap in. It's a local classic for sure. Some up and coming rappers include RTO The Plug and Pooh. It's also Project Bo. He's been dropping music for a few years at this point. And Bro's cool. Real catchy bars, and his voice is real distinctive. Definitely sounds like he's from the West Coast, but his voice stands out. It's also spaced out morning. Bro's dope too. He sounds like an OGZ with a lot of druggy bars, but just a lot more gang shit out lyrics. It's also Hood Trophy Bino, who signed a Stocks on Deck Entertainment, and he definitely stands out amongst his peers in Los Angeles with his hooks and storytelling. But I got a good question. Do they have any songs together? Each of these artists sound good individually, but I personally think they put some fire-ass tracks together, especially come from Spaced Out Marnie and Hood Trophy Bino. But y'all let me know in the comments if they already have music together. Also, y'all let me know if any other artists and music being dropped from this game. Let's get that music heard. Current State of the Pebble Bishop Bloods When it comes to the current state of Pebble Bishop Bloods, today, they stand as one of the most active gangs functioning in the low bottom. With the long history of having more than a few prominent members who put fear into a lot of their enemies, the Peblos have definitely earned their respect when it comes to Los Angeles gang politics. From known factors like the Stutterboxes and a bunch of other foot soldiers, it's said to say this gang has grown a lot since its foundation. The growth can be seen in the fact that they have subsets in different states as well. For example, it's Pebble Bishop Bloods in Texas, Connecticut, Arizona, Georgia, and New York. But y'all let me know in the comments I'm mentioning your state, man. Rep for your state. That's it for the Pale Bishop Bloods, though. Y'all got any crazy stories about these guys? Any close calls? 
Did I miss anything? Did I get anything wrong? Y'all let me know in the comments. Let's have a conversation about it. Hey, don't forget to like and subscribe if you fuck with this video. Or if you're a part of the Danger Gang. Y'all stay safe for dangers out there.